It is entertainment first. It is entertainment for gamers, so I think it has a little bit of edutainment in there, and the education is hopefully we're teaching you some things about the game or opening your eyes to some things you might want to try and pull off. YouTube is such a hard business because if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, those are extremely difficult professions, but there is not millions of people literally doing it for free competing with you. Not even doing it for free, paying money to do it losing money right. to do it. That's how hard it is to sort of make it in the content creation business. You have a huge amount of people that are literally paying money to try and do it. You cannot make your content better if you don't first make the take responsibility that it's not currently as good as it could be. It is what we do from the time when you think it's done to the time that the audience sees it that separates us from everybody else. That How much can we improve it from what the initial edit or whatever looks like to when the final is. The most important thing to me is like being excited to wake up every morning. And we'll have meetings here where financially there are better decisions for the company to make, but I'll always make the one that's like, yeah, but that one's gonna make us more excited to wake up in the morning, right? If I choose a lane that's like financially better, but I won't like waking up in the morning, then I'm gonna be in stop mode, not full throttle mode. And we won't be successful. Josh Lee Kwai is the CEO of the Command Zone and the creative force behind Game Nights and Extra Churns. He's a longtime Hollywood insider and has played a hand in several major films, including Star Wars, Fast and Furious, and The Avengers. In this conversation, we sit down and I pick his brain on leadership and the creative process. Whether you want to know how the command zone runs behind the scenes, or just want to be inspired by Josh's method, there's something here for you. All right, here's Josh Lee Kwai. Hey Josh, how's it going, man? It's going great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. How has your week been? I, I kind of have a sense from our back and forth over email that it's been quite the hectic week to say the least, but I want to hear straight from you. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's been hectic, but that's par for the course around here. I, I'd say like every week is hectic. This is the week right after New Year's. So all the holidays just happened and, um, you know, we have a pretty large staff and a lot of them obviously take time off during the holidays. Uh, so it's always a crunch coming back and sort of catching up. You know, because when people are out, work sort of, sort of piles up and then it's getting everybody back up to speed. And so, yeah, but I mean, that's, there's always something, right? We've got, uh, we've got MagicCon Philly coming up and we were doing Game Nights Live. So we've got a ton of stuff on our plate that's not normally there and, the, you know, all our normal stuff. So did you have a good holiday season? Did you take time off? I took a couple of days off for Christmas, went and visited some family uh, in San Diego, which is very close to LA and, but you know, just a few days, um, yeah. The holidays were, were good. Um, I don't know. They, they weren't exciting. I just I just got to rest a little bit, which is actually nice. Okay, excellent. I thought I would actually start off by asking you about Miles Davis. You had a quotation that you were quite inspired by Miles Davis on. I'm wondering if you could actually just repeat that and uh, kind of just just set it up for the for the audience. Sure. Uh, I hope I get the wording exactly right. It might. It's going to be close. Hopefully. Um, Miles Davis said that the difference between a fair musician and a good musician is that a good musician can play whatever they think of. And then the difference between a good musician and a great one is what they think. Right. So uh, how did you get exposed to Miles Davis in the first place? Oh, boy. I'm not sure. I, I think I just came across that quote probably in a book or something at some point, and it kind of resonated with me. There's another quote, I don't know if I've said it on the show, that I think is somewhat related, um, and it is from Larry Bird, and I, I believe it was in like his autobiography or something, and he, he just had this very simple thing, was like, when I was a kid, I played basketball with my friends for fun, and I just kind of noticed that when I shot the ball, it went in more often than theirs. <laughs> so uh, how, how does that inspire you, the Larry Bird quote? Well, I think it's interesting because I don't really believe that inherent talent matters a ton. Um, but the Larry Burke quote kind of goes in the opposite direction where it says, well, he just noticed he did have some inherent talent in, uh, you know, in basketball from an early age. He just kind of noticed that, well, when I shoot it, it goes in more than when they shoot it. And it's, you know, that's an inherent talent quote. The Miles Davis one is more about, you know, sort of changing your thinking or being aware of what you're thinking and, what boxes you might be in and that you're the barrier to greatness for anybody is there's a pretty good chance it's because of your own thinking and the box you put yourself in. And so the ability to sort of think differently is one of the things that has a chance to make us great. 
what are some of the things that you've done you think that where you went outside that box like was there a particular realization moment earlier on in your career or life where like that that quote just really resonated with you maybe i'm not sure that i can think of a specific moment there's a there's another thing i like to tell um sort of our team or i've talked about many times i'm sure a lot of stuff if, if any of our teams listening to this they're going to roll their eyes and they've heard me say this, this stuff a thousand times but um whenever you're doing a project uh you know working on movies or a podcast or game nights or whatever it is i love it when people that come in to help on the project or work on it in a small piece kind of look around and be like you 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 people are crazy like this is crazy this is you know either that's not how it should be done or i've never seen it done like this way and i always am like yes because if we're not crazy then we're just like everybody else and so i like to sort of do the things that seem nuts um and, you know, Game Nights itself is kind of a crazy undertaking because it is just way more effort, you know, honestly, than seems warranted for a web series about a small niche trading card game. And I think most people that come on to uh, the show kind of leave with the idea of, like, that's what they're doing is, is crazy. It's too much work. It's too much effort. It's too meticulous. Um and I always look at that as a feather in, in, in the cap of like, yep, they think we're crazy. Like, we must be doing something right. Does it still feel crazy to you guys now, like, producing an episode in the middle of? Or is it you're so used to the kind of standards that you've set for you and your team that it's it's just the new norm? Well, I think that there's always that danger that it does become the norm. And then you're not you're not that crazy anymore. And And, you know one of the challenges for us is to keep pushing the envelope and keep in the pocket there as far as like, you know, right on the edge of what is reasonable. Um, and we try to keep doing that. And I think, I'm not sure when this episode you and I are recording is going to come out, but we just did something which I think is kind of crazy for the all will be one episode of game nights where we really push the envelope as far as what we're doing with our production design and our set direction. And you're, you're going to watch it or we'll have watched it depending. And I think it's going to be like, Whoa, uh, they've never done that before, and that seems kind of crazy. And it's like we built a whole set in, like, a different warehouse and, like, you know, pretty much went for it. And, um, you know, it wasn't cheap, and it took a long time and a lot of uh, logistics. But, you know, I think for our show, most people will be like, you know, they walked onto the set, and they're like, this is, this is nuts. Like, you know, it's such a huge step above what we normally do. And, you know, again, I get to go be like, aha, this is nuts. Good. We're right where we want to be. What, what's that like working with your team on that? Because I understand as the CEO, you probably have to set the tone or set the vision. But when you're proposing something, uh, actually, first of all, I, I assume that it's kind of like uh, ideas meritocracy, correct me if I'm wrong, where it's just like, you know, people just spitball different ideas. And I, I, I kind of have that feeling, maybe maybe reading too much into it, but just the feeling from actually watching the finished products, like there's a lot of creativity going on. But what's it like when you're trying to push something as maybe the de facto leader and you might be getting people like saying like, Josh, this can't be done, or maybe we should tone it back a little bit. Like, how do you balance that kind of uh, back and forth with your team? Yeah, well, firstly, it is very much like a collaborative effort between our team. I think that's sort of the best way to go. You, you know, you bring in really talented people and then, you know, you hope that everybody sort of makes each other better. Um, and I see my job a lot more these days has sort of morphed from the person like doing the individual tasks. Like I don't really edit anymore, even though I was an editor for almost 20 years, I don't really touch premiere pro and get in the editing timeline and do stuff anymore. That's mostly other people. My job has become more about like setting our team up for success and then helping to corral all of the ideas into like finding what the best one is and, making decisions about what we're going to execute on and then making sure that like the targets we're aiming for are, you know, worthy of aiming for hittable, but not easily. Right. So it is our goal. It's like, um, I like to sort of compare it to like, if you work out at a gym, if you work out by yourself, you're not going to get, you're not gonna be able to push as hard or get, make as many gains as if you have a spotter, because what the spotter allows you to do is go past the point of safety for if you're by yourself. And so if you're lifting a certain amount of weight, you have to stop earlier if you don't have a spotter than if you do because it's dangerous. You might drop the weight 
But if you have somebody there who's willing and able to catch the weight and help you lift those, you get a, a couple more reps. A spotter really only gives you like two, maybe one or two more reps at the end of a set. But the gains over the course of time from just being able to push yourself, because most of your games re- gains really occur at the end of a set when your muscles are taxed to the point of exhaustion. And so that's how I see myself in a lot of ways um, is a spotter, encouraging people, but also, you know, making them do that one extra rep that they probably wouldn't have done on their own, pushing them a little bit harder, asking a little bit more of them, you know, putting pushing that bar. And so I think that's become, you know, a big part of my job is, you know, really setting our goals high, attainable, but, you know, for instance, this um, this all will be one episode of game nights I am referring to. Yeah, I think our whole team was like a little bit when we decided on our course of action, like looking at the calendar and being like, okay, can we get this done in this time? Can we, you know, it's it be it'll be cool if we can. But there was a little bit of panic, a little bit of like. We don't know. And that's, again, exactly where I like to be. I don't want it to be like, this is impossible, literally. But you also don't want it to be like, yeah, no problem. We got this. Because that means that you're not pushing yourself. You're not doing that extra set. Sorry, that extra rep. Yeah. That's so, the workout analogy. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I know, As a I know guy you... who used to work out and clearly has it in a long time. <laughs> I, I, I do remember seeing, maybe it was some old photos of yours where you were completely jacked. Like, like how long ago was that? That was like, was it college days or was it uh, afterwards? No, it was probably like um, 10 years, maybe 12 years ago. I used to be in extremely good shape. I used to work out a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm hoping to get back to that. The, the problem is that I have very little time these days. I mean, running your own company is, you know, infinite work and YouTube specifically is just an extremely and the entertainment business I, business i guess also falls into this but youtube is such a hard business because there like if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor which are also difficult don't get me wrong like <laughs> those are extremely difficult professions but there is not millions of people literally doing it for free competing with you not actually no <laughs> sorry let me let, not even doing it for free paying money to do it Losing right. money to do it. Right. right. So, right. yeah, that that's how hard it is to sort of make it in the content creation business. You have a huge amount of people that are literally paying money to try and do it. Yeah. So, you know, it's not the ty- type of thing where you end up with a lot of free time if you're trying to do it, So, if you're successful. So how do you I, feel being part of that machine? Like just, just command, night, uh, command zone and game nights being part of the, I guess, subject to the algorithm like everybody is, right, in terms of these platforms like YouTube and such. Yeah, I don't like to – I'm not really that concerned with the algorithm, and I don't like to worry about that too much. I think in the end, especially YouTube, it's pretty simple, right? Like as long as your in, incentives line up with what YouTube's want, w- with what YouTube wants, I think you're pretty much fine. So as long as you're creating something that people are going to want to watch, YouTube is going to want to put that in front of people because their mm-hmm. whole – like what does YouTube want? People to be on YouTube, Right. So if you're helping them with that goal for the most part, uh, and there's obviously some outliers of subject matter and things like that, 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 you know, nobody's willing to sell their soul, even YouTube at a certain price. Um, but as long as you're within a reasonable subject matter, if what you're doing is compelling and people want to watch it, there's all these conspiracy theories that content creators fall into about why my video is not getting recommended or whatever. And, you know, the reality of the situation is we're all sp- – really small fries. YouTube doesn't care individually about any creator. It only cares like, are people watching your video? Do they, do they like it? And the way that YouTube knows if they like it is if they are, they don't just click on it and then click away right away. Do they continue to watch mm-hmm. it for a long period of time? And that's really, I think the only measurements that matter. So as far as the algorithm, sorry, I went on a tangent, tangent about the algorithm. Um, the Your question about being part of the machinery I guess I don't know how to, if it matters how I feel about it as far mm-hmm. as like that is just I am compelled to do this as a as a person. Um, you know, I was in the movie business and the entertainment industry before this. And, you know, I grew up. My dad ran a local cable channel. Like, I don't know. I was never going to be an NBA player because I didn't you know, I stopped growing up 510. So, you know, I didn't ever really have another dream or another thought in my head. Like, I'm going to create content um, one way or another. So, you know, yeah, that's how it goes. In a way, I think I think worrying about things like the algorithm is kind of 
just not productive, right? Because it's just like, it's not really in our control. Like the only thing we can control is just put the best content out there that we think people want to watch, right? As a YouTuber or as a, a YouTube uh, production. And that's all you can do, right? And then let the chips fall where they may, I guess. Yeah, I super agree with that. And I think just in life, people are pretty bad at just taking responsibility for, you know, anything. So they always want to cry BS on a lot of things. And it's like, even whether that's true or not, so many things are out of your control. Like it's pointless to care about them. It's so much, e it's so much better for you. Maybe not easier. It's actually harder to sort of take responsibility and put the, what you care about sort of only in the lap of the things that you actually have control over. So what do I have control over? Well, it's not YouTube and there, that algorithm. I have nothing to do with that. So what can I, what do I have control over? Well, it's the content that I make and, you know, what knobs can I turn and dials to, you know, make it so that it is compelling to the audience and the audience is enjoying it to make good content. But I think a lot of people get in the instance where like they're complaining about the algorithm or, or, you know, whatever else. And what they're really kind of saying is that I think my content's awesome and everybody else doesn't think so. That can't be true. Actually, it must be for another reason. Mm. And that reason is the algorithm or something else rather than taking responsibility and going, my content's probably not awesome. Yep. And that that realization and that ad, admitting that probably would help you because if you would, you cannot make your content better if you don't first make the take responsibility that it's not currently as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to say like all the data that I have access to is telling me that my content is not as good as it can be. Cool. Now I can with knowing that I can look at my content with a more critical eye and say, OK, well, then what can I try and change about it that will change that paradigm? and make it more compelling and make people stick around and make people want to watch it because sitting here and just making the same thing over and over and complaining that some outside force that I have no control over is the reason that I'm not famous and I don't have a million views or whatever. Well, I think we all know how that's going to turn out, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a sense of misguidedness or maybe even I would say a kind of entitlement. It's like I'm entitled to get more recognition for what I do, even though you're not looking at it so critically, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with the entitlement thing. I could because I think I see that in like team members here and I think I alluded to it earlier and it's a symptom of a same it's just a very human condition. I don't think it's a problem anyone specifically has. It is just like you have to know like this is an obstacle in your brain that everybody has, which is one of the great hurdles to success is you having to sort of do something, change something, admit something and try a different way than you're currently doing it. But that's mm -hmm. hard. So mm -hmm. let's say I look at, um, let's say an editor puts together something here and you know we, we have a lot of meetings where we look at stuff and we talk about it and we try and improve it. And a big piece of our culture that I drill into everybody is like, it is what we do from the time when you think it's done to the time that the audience sees it that separates us from everybody else. That How much can we improve it from what the initial edit or whatever looks like to when the final is because the draft one of anything is not going to be as good as, you know, careful decisions and revisions made. You know, I don't care if it's a book, an article, a song, you know, there's just very few cases, a movie, a TV show where it's just like, yeah, I wrote it and then I changed nothing and it was amazing. You know, it's usually like I wrote it. I went to sleep. I woke up the next day. I noticed all these mistakes or changes. I've flipped it around. I showed it to a friend. They pointed out a bunch of stuff. I, I showed it to a bunch of people. Brandon Sanderson, he has like a whole brain trust group of people that read his stuff um, before he even gives it like to his editor or whatever, I think. You know, he's got a process by which, and we have a huge process internally for that same sort of thing, which is like, you know, anything that gets, you know, any little project or whatever that gets made, multiple people look at it, they give input on it. We expect input from everybody. Our culture is a culture that like the V1 of something is meant to be changed, meant to be improved. And we don't want to live in a world where the V1 is what goes out to the rest, you know, to the public. Mm -hmm. That's, we're just not going to get the best stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I forgot where we started that little. No, no, not a problem at all. Actually, I want to follow up on what you just said, which is like, is there a point where it can be detrimental to to iterate too much on something? Like, for example, maybe 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 the third cut is actually better than the twelfth cut, right? But you're doing something up to the wire before release. And I'm thinking about movies. I'm thinking about like 
game nights productions. I'm thinking about just any creative work. And also it's magnified because you've got a whole crew working on it, right? So it's not even just like one person, but it's like, yeah, could there be a death of a thousand cuts or how do you find that balance? Yeah, I think you definitely can revive some revise something past the point where you're making it better and now you're actually making it worse. And the trick is sort of having the confidence to know when you've hit that point and admit it and go back. Um, so I like to say, you know, we'll give revision to re give revisions. And then at some point I go, uh oh, that last revision, I think we made it worse. Yeah. Um, let's go back. And if you never hear anybody in your collaborative circle say words like that, then they are maybe have the wrong mindset. They want to be right. Mm. Mm. They're not serving the video at, or the whatever it is, the song or the painting or whatever it is. If you never hear somebody who's giving creative feedback say the you know some form of the words of like, oh, that's worse. I made it worse. Or that following that note made it worse. Let's go back. It was better the way it was before. That mm -hmm. tells you that person is actually critically looking at the thing and trying to judge what's better, not judge, hey, did I save this? Did I come up with the coolest idea? Is it me, me, me? It shouldn't be. It should be the thing, the video. What is best for the outcome of the Serving project? Serving the product as opposed yeah. to one's individual ego. Like I remember reading a recent article with, uh, I think it was uh, Steve Martin about this, right? Mm -hmm. Because he, he was very much about iterating and still is today about iterating his routine and comedy and jokes. And I know he's doing TV as well, but he mentioned that he was doing some sort of like traveling show with i think it was uh martin short like they were basically mm -hmm. doing a they were working on a joke together and they kind of realized that in their th third or fourth iteration of the joke that it didn't actually work as well so actually steve martin actually said let's just kill this joke and just go back to me not saying anything and it ended up like just working better but it's just like even when someone when you have someone at kind of like the the highest level of creativity can still like just kill his darlings like and just do it uh take one for the team and just let his counterpart like deliver the, the joke the way it was supposed to be instead of involving himself in it. Like that's really powerful when, when that can happen, but it's, it's very rare, right? Yeah. I don't know how rare it is. I see it a lot in, uh, in LA and, and in the, in showbiz, you know, I worked at the movie studios for a long, long time. And I think that's where I learned it. Like most of the best people that I worked with or was around and, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I, I mean, I've been in rooms with whoever you can name and, you know, Edgar Wright, Steven Spielberg, like, you know, JJ Abrams, I've been on, conference calls or in rooms with people like that and the best ones are able to do it they don't you know ridley scott like they will say things like uh they will they will make suggestions and then realize that they they are their suggestion is bad or it was wrong or it led us in a bad path and they are serving the finished product they are not trying to and and it, those people like have the wherewithal or the, i guess they have the standing that of course like they're uh reputation is not going to be tarnished in any way. No one in the room is like, uh Oh, Steven Spielberg said that that idea he said earlier was bad. He must suck at his job. You know, <laughs> like nobody's saying things <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. you know, so they have the self-confidence to just be able to actually only worry about like what, you know, what is this do to the finished thing, finished thing. So it doesn't surprise me that Steve Martin, somebody who's been around forever and had a ton of success would have that mindset as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but now I remember what we were originally talking about and it was about, um, the impediments to change causing people to not change. And that a lot of time that impediment is just that it will be difficult. And so we were talking about the fact that like, let's say I'm looking at an edit that an editor has done and I'm talking to them about what I think should happen. And one of the things I'm always judging is their reaction when they push back uh, against like what we're suggesting or, or they're involved in the conversation. The person that has to do the work always also has like at least a small part of their brain that is calculating how hard the work itself will be. And that shouldn't be for the most part, uh, a huge factor in whether or not that work should be done because the real calculation is, yeah, but how good, how much better will that make the piece in the end? Now we're in the real world and sometimes you have to say like, okay, well the video has to come out at two, two o'clock tomorrow. Um, so yeah, we would love to, you know, hire a special effects team and put an animated transforming robot into this thing, but we don't have the money and we don't have the time for that. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're not open to every single idea that could ever happen, but for the most part, it's like, um, you know, a common thing you hear from editors is like, if I change that, then my, then I have to change all of my music and editing music is hard and takes, a, and it, you know, is not easy. And I'm always like, yeah, but will, but will the video be better at the end of it?
then mm-hmm. sorry, you've got to change your music and you've got to make that change because that's not mm-hmm. a valid reason to not make the change. The only valid reason would be, I think that will be worse for the viewer. Right. That's something that you can accept as an argument, but, but not the other one. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And that's me as a spotter, right? I'm forcing you. You're, you're saying like, I can't do one more rep. This is heavy now. And I'm saying, don't worry. I got you. I'll just take five pounds off this and you can do yeah. it. Yeah. And don't worry. It won't fall on your face. It won't hurt you. <laughs> that's your safety net. But it's going to be hard. You're going to shake a little, you know, you're going to be more tired. You're going to be more out of breath at the end of it. But you'll have gotten more out of it because, you know, that last rep is where you worked your muscles to exhaustion. You'll get the most gains out of that. Mm-hmm. I think continuity is also very important. Like to use the weightlifting analogy, like you could do one or two or three or four hard workouts and not really feel the effects, but it compounds over a very long period of time. So can you talk to me about how you sort of developed kind of the right culture with your team over time? Because I assume that, you know, many of them have been with the production for a while. And so there starts to become perhaps like, better trust and just kind of more willing to uh, venture into the unknown because it's, it's a, it's a continuous process built up over episodes and episodes, right? Yeah. I think building culture is one of the most difficult things to do, uh, you know, when you've got your own business and you're running your own team and things like that. And I, uh, you know, I worked at a lot of different companies coming up, Disney, Universal, some big ones, and then some smaller companies you've never heard of that basically subcontract with the studios. So I've worked at, you know, multi-thousand person companies and then companies that have 50 or less people. And I think I just kind of instinctively, because at the start, I'll be honest, like I didn't like write down like, oh, let's worry about company culture and here's what it should be. Sometime later into the process after we hired some people, I was like, this is a thing I should probably think about and be more cognizant of. And, you know, at a certain point, we did kind of come up with, Um, you know, a list of core values and things that are important to our company culture, just so we have some North Stars and some guiding lights in those regards. But, you know, this is very much a company that was, you know, just started by me and Jimmy in a a condo, you know, (laughs) you know, and then it was like, well, we should hire a person. Oh, boy, we probably need another person. And before you know it, we're like, well, we have seven or eight people. We're kind of a company now. We should probably, you know, do some things like have official payroll and, you know, figure out all the laws regarding everything and like actually, you know, form an LLC and all this other stuff. We did that before seven people, but, um, so yeah, company culture is something that I've sort of worried about more in the last four years, maybe than I did in the first three or or two or three or whatever, however old we are now. Um, and yeah, a lot of it just is figuring out what, you know, values are important to me. And I think gets us to the place we need to be with the content and then, just sort of espousing those values as much as possible and talking to people about them. And like I said, with about my team, like rolling their eyes when I say things that they've heard a million times, um, that's the way you hopefully instill culture though. And, 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 you know, most of our team, especially our, our people that have been here for a long time and are trusted, uh, have bought into that stuff. Um, and they either came with pieces of our culture or already were pretty good fits, or they sort of picked them up along the way. Uh, for the most part, we have a lot of people here who were more or less trained from the ground up. Like they came up here, had never really worked in entertainment or YouTube before. We have a few people that came in with experience, but a lot of them are sort of like, you know, hand built, uh, brick by brick, you know, Murph, who is one of the lead editors and he directs episodes of game nights. Now he didn't even know how to start a project in premiere when he started here. Uh, so he's literally been just, you know, learned everything here as far as the, that stuff. And so it's really good to have those, you know, those pure pieces of clay because there's no, you don't have to deprogram anything. So that's mm-hmm. the advantages of that. And then, you know, but then of course you get people that come in and they've had other cultures and they're used to other ways of thinking and that can be a problem, but then you also get the fact that they already have experience and talent. So it's always kind of a give and take. So what are some of those values that you, you, you emphasize? You don't have to list them all, but I'm just curious, give me an example or two. Let me see if I can find the document um, that has the core values because, I mean, they're not really a secret. I can kind of tell them to you if I can find it real fast. All right, so we've got four main core values. Our first one is constant learning and improvement. Um, We do this, uh, we say we always want to be growing. We always want to learn new skills. We want to push boundaries, iterate, upgrade. 
Um, we don't want to stagnate. Stagnate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do this through compassionate directness, which is we serve the finished content. We have the ability to both take and receive criticism. Uh, feedback is a reflection on the video or the podcast or whatever the project is. It is not a reflection on the person who is giving or receiving the feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, the, the other point is carry support, which means we support one another. We help, we teach, we communicate. If a teammate needs us, we don't just sort of tell them what we think should happen. We jump in the trench with them and try and fight the battle. Uh, our second core uh, value is we are nimble. We understand that great ideas can strike at any time, and we try and build our process so that we are able to pivot and take advantage of great ideas that come even late in the process. So we build our projects and our videos and our ideas with the knowledge that change is inevitable. We want change to occur. Good ideas are going to strike us, and we are not tied to whatever. It's that Steve Martin thing, right? If they had decided the night before a performance that that was the best way to go, I bet they would have gone with that, right? Even though it's going to be a little iffy if you're deciding the night before a performance or maybe even just walking out onto the stage beforehand, you know, they might make that decision. But if you think that, you know, it's going to be better and you can pull it off, then up till the latest minute you can, you've got to be open to the changes. But that's another one of those hurdles I was talking about earlier where it can seem like, ah, oh, that, that would be awesome, but we, there's no way you can pull that up in time, you know? There's uh, the video's got to go up tomorrow, and there's you know it's gonna be. Jeez, I'm gonna have to stay up all all night to make that happen. And you know those are the calculations that we try to make. And so I'm not I'm not saying we try and make people stay up all night or things like that. But a lot of times, the germ of the idea that you at first think is crazy to try and pull off in the time and will have you stay up all night. A lot of times you go, okay, we can't stay up all night. But what is that idea doing that we like so much? Is there a version of it that doesn't take that amount of time? Or, or is there a way that we can, instead of one person stays up eight, for the next eight hours to finish it, can, is there some way we can get eight people to work one hour? Because eight people working one hour extra is a lot more. Is there a version of this that, you know, so that we still end up with the best idea at the end of the day? And I like to say that um, our YouTube channel and, and kind of all of them, it's – People can fall into this trap where it feels like you're in competition with, like, the other magic uh, outlets. Like, like oh, we could see the professor as, like, competition for us, you know. Because anybody, anytime anybody's watching a prop video, they're not watching a command zone video. And I think there is some amount of that that is true, but it's just that is narrowing it down too much. Like, we're competing with HBO. We're competing with Netflix. Like, every mm-hmm. time you're watching game nights, you could be watching any number of media outlets, right? Mm-hmm. And then when you think on that scale, like worrying about Prof, first of all, is stupid because, you know, he's such a small drop in the bucket compared to Disney Plus and all the rest of it, right? Like there's just this huge landscape. And then so you start to think about like, okay, well, if those are my competitors, like what advantages do I have versus HBO? It would seem like you have none, right? Like they have access to the best talent. They got tons of money, unlimited resources, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there, there is actually when you start to break down some advantages that you have, and one of them is nimbleness, flexibility, the ability to – HBO has a really hard time if they come up with an idea. You're not going to see it for two years. Well, if I come up with an idea, you might see it next Tuesday. So that is an advantage that we've got. So being able to remain nimble, to um, have, you know, to to remain flexible and get rid of that block in your brain that says, like, yeah, but I worked so hard to get it to here, and now they want to change it to this other thing, you know. Uh, Okay. Our third core value is that we're bold. Um. We commit to an idea. We push all our chips chips in the middle. We don't feel fear failure, uh, and we're powered by the phrase, "You know what would be cool." And then our fourth, um, and that's the thing. Sorry, I guess I should expand on number three. That's the thing we were talking about earlier. Of like, I like to be right on the edge of reasonable, <laughs> like right into mm-hmm. one foot into crazy, right? Like that's that that to me is what's when you're being bold. You're trying things that make you a little uneasy that you're not sure if you can pull it off. Um. And then the last one is we're, we're professionals. So we maintain our high quality standards. Um, I like to say that amateurs can sort of wait around for inspiration to strike, but professionals have to go now and hit your deadline. So sometimes you can't wait for like the perfect idea to strike you. You have to have a video that comes out next week. Cause you know why? Everybody's got to pay their rent and their car insurance. You know, you can't afford to just only make a video when a cool idea strikes you. Um, and, and that's the difference sort of between a pro and an am, amateur. We're also very thorough. We cross all our T's. We dot all our I's. We hit all our deadlines. You know, 
And then we, under the same umbrella as, you know, I, uh, we conduct ourselves with class. We try to stay above the fray. We try to stay dignified. I think we try not to get involved in a lot of the drama. Mm -hmm. So when you hire, when you hire people, you're also taking into account these values, right? Is, is the person, they get a whole document, they get that entire them. document and I go over it with them. Yeah. In the hiring process. And I, you know, talk to them about it. And I, one of the things we do is try and make sure they're going to be a good fit for those values. Obviously hiring is a whole thing and it's hard because people want jobs and they're going to tell you what uh, you want to hear. So, yeah. you know, it's always a, a little bit of a game um, trying to figure out like what's real and what isn't, but yeah, definitely it's a big point of emphasis for us. Right. Have those values been uh, basically in your mind that way since day one, or has it changed over time? Maybe added more definition to some of them. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I don't think I had any list of values sort of list, you know, in my head at all when we started it. And I, this is sort of a new thing. I think net Netflix might be the one or definitely startup culture is sort of the thing that sort of bought, brought this idea of company philosophy and culture to the forefront. And I worked in, you know, older companies, Disney universal. So I don't think I ever saw a company culture document at any place I worked. Um, but yeah, it was something that I started thinking about a few years into running this company and in researching, you know, I've never been a CEO before, right? Like I'm an editor, like I'm, you know, I'm a craftsman in some ways. And so as I started to research, like, how do you run a company? Like, what are you supposed to do? And how, what are best practices? And there's all kinds of things that at the start, I didn't know much about like negotiating terms of contracts and, you know, deals and things like that, that I had to learn. So I was reading a lot of books and listening to a lot of podcasts and, you know, the idea of company culture kind of got put on my radar and that's when I started thinking about it. So. Um, from that point forward, I sort of originally jotted down a list of like nine core values. And for a while we, you know, I sort of had nine and then I realized like nine is way too many. If you have nine core values, you have zero core values. You don't really believe in it. <laughs> so then I sort of slowly narrowed them down to what I thought were the, those four like real, you know, foundational things that were important to me and that I thought were important to, you know, our company. Mm -hmm. How do you test your ideas? Like when you have you must have strong beliefs in the first place, but when you're, are there people in the company that you bounce ideas off of to, I, I'm not talking about the projects, but I'm talking about like, you know, is this value something we should be pushing for? Uh, can we make adjustments to the way that I'm managing and leading? Like, do you have people that, do you have a process for having people keep you honest or like having dialogue with other people, maybe within and also outside the company? Yeah, so I, I'm glad you said outside as well. So I'll start with within. Uh, definitely there are, you know, people here, the trusted people, the more senior people that have been here, you know, the longest, um, or not necessarily the longest, but the people who, you know, maybe have the experience, um, or for whatever reason are, are the trusted advisor style people. But yeah, they're definitely like brain trust here within. I think everybody here is super talented and great. And, you know, there's obviously different levels as far as where people are in the hierarchy at any company and the people are at the sort of. Uh, on the top level for us are, you know, I will often call in and sort of pick brains or try out ideas or float ideas a lot of times, or here's different paths that I'm thinking of, but I'm not sure which is the right one, get some input. Um, Jimmy, of course, is, you know, uh, part owner in the company and everything and has been with us from the start. So he's a, a, a big factor in a lot of that stuff and the high level decisions. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the people that work here that are involved in, um, you know, a lot of stuff different aspects. I mean, we have people behind the scenes now that are only dealing with sort of business stuff that aren't even involved with the content that, you know, nobody out there would really know or see, but, you know, we have to make financial decisions and things like that. And so a lot of that has, you know, needs to go through them because they understand, you know, all kinds of stuff that I have no idea about, like tax laws and stuff like that. So, you know, <laughs> there's definitely different people that I go to and talk to for different types of decisions. And then outside the company, um, I definitely have, you know, people that I've reached out to over the years that are kind of the, I think people sort of refer to these as like mastermind groups. Um, and I don't have a mastermind group exactly, but I do have a group of trusted people that are not affiliated with command zone that I just know have expertise. So prof is like one of these people, prof and I touch base a few times a year and compare notes about what we've got going on. And I help him and he helps me and we give each other perspective. And we're also able to sort of compare numbers and things like that and make sure that, you know, 
all the sponsorship deals and the branding and everything else and what our view counts and everything it just helps us sort of identify trends and forces a little bit better and then you know have other people like jimmy's brother freddie uh wong is like one of the original youtubers and has definitely been around the block for a lot longer than i have so and he does the dungeon and dungeons and daddies podcast now which is like one of the top 50 podcasts in the world and like freddie's just kind of good at everything and super smart guy so he's a guy that i will go to and like pick his brain about things like that and then just you know, I worked at a few companies, so, you know, I'm in touch with a couple of the owners of my old companies because I'm just like, you know, stuff about payroll or HR, or just all this stuff that, like, you, there's just no way for you to know about until you're running a company, you know. So different people, different advice, but definitely always out there, like, looking for perspective and experience. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with Prof or, or Brian. Uh, you know, I, I have a sense that you guys have quite a special kinship or bond like how did you guys first uh connect and how has that relationship developed over time well prof and i we go way back um we connected first because we got him on our podcast like a long time ago and this is when you know prof was maybe like twenty thousand subs on youtube so it was very very early on we were pretty small at the time as well and so we were on each other's radar almost from the very beginning and you know early on we were just guys having fun making content still had day jobs he was still an actual professor and i was still you know editing movie trailers i think at disney at the time and we would run into each other at events and you know talk about magic things and then we started talking about you know the business of creating the content and sort of the back end stuff a few years later as we both continued to grow and you know we've made similar steps along the way like he eventually quit his job and did this full time and I quit my job and did this full time. We eventually like both, you know, sort of got dedicated spaces and office space where we were going to do this, built little studios, you know, started dealing with sponsors and branding and promotional deals and, you know, all of the paperwork and contracts and crap that go with all of that. And so we just found ourselves as kindred spirits as far as facing a lot of the same obstacles and problems and, it's nice to just have somebody that's, uh, you know, in a s similar s spot to you that you can kind of bounce things off of because they, in a lot of ways, Prof and I, you know, sort of know exactly where the other one's coming from because we've been there or close to where they are right now because, you know, we're, we're in pretty similar spaces in a lot of ways. And we're also in the same niche as far as like Magic the Gathering. So we, you know, totally are. And, and you know, famously, Prof and I don't agree about everything, um, you know, and anybody who's been around us knows what we kind of argue about uh, the way we see the world. Uh, a lot, but that's actually very helpful for somebody like this because they give you an outside perspective that you wouldn't have thought of. And so as much as I, you know, somebody that's just sitting there and thinks the exact way you think is not actually that helpful to you because they're not adding anything new to the equation when you, you know, when you come up to a problem that you don't know how to solve. Whereas if you come up with a problem you don't know how to solve, well, you didn't know how to solve it. So your way of thinking is not solving it. So somebody that comes around and goes, well, have you thought about this? And you're like, oh, no, I would never have thought that. But that is interesting. Uh, you know, I think Prof and I can kind of serve that role for each other as well. Yeah. So uh, Prof told me a very touching story about the two of you. Uh, maybe I'll just set it up and you can hopefully finish it for me if you actually remember sure. what that was. <laughs> so he said that uh, because I know that for you guys, you guys are affiliated with Wizards. So yep. you guys are in Wizards, so-called good graces and, and such. And I think Prof has always had kind of a, to put it nicely, like an up and down relationship with Wizards in terms of him being very honest all the time. Like I'm not, he's, he's just honest all the time about uh, the way he sees products and releases and things like that. And so he has felt at times like kind of ostracized from Wizards. So uh, he told me a story where he said, he, he talked to you about like, you know, being or not being on your production and what you said back to him. Maybe, do you remember this interaction? If so, could you maybe, uh, replay it back for us? I'm um, yeah. Well, I think I said like, oh, well they can't tell me who is going to be on my show. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause he was, have... he was concerned that you, yeah. you might like, you might not want to have him on your production because of his, uh, standing Adversarial relationship. Yeah. yeah, he has an adversarial relationship with them, which is unfortunate. And I've tried to help uh, mend those bridges sometimes. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But, yeah, um, the, the deal we have with Wizards, um, you know, 
that isn't to the point where they they can say things like you can't have prop on your show. And I don't think they would say that. First of all, I just want to be very clear. This is not something they've said to me and, and not something I think they ever would say. But I know prop was worried about it. And I was like, you know, basically, that's not that's not a worry. If we want to have you on, we're going to have you on. And I don't know. What did he say? I said. Maybe he remembers that quote. That's pretty much it. Yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if you had more that you remembered, so I thought I would ask. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. I mean, that's the, you know, I, I, that's never really been a worry. I know that Prof worries about it more than I think anybody else really does, to be honest. I don't think Wizards is super worried about it in all my uh, conversations with them as well. Um, I think Prof is, you know, I don't, I don't like when people say, well, Prof is honest. Uh, all the time to a fault, implying somehow that other people like us are not honest, right? Like mm. uh, we've never been dishonest in the way that we've portrayed anything. We've never said we love something if we don't love it. And we've never said that we hate something if we don't hate it. No, uh, I, I listened to your year end show where you review recap 2022 with uh, Rachel and Jimmy. So I, I know you guys like call it like it is, right? So, yeah, we don't get a lot of credit for that. And I think it's because our show is nuts and bolts. It's really about like the strategy of the game. And we didn't really build it with the idea that we would be commenting on the sort of, you know, the more controversial just sidebar stuff that doesn't have to do with, like, when you're actually playing Magic. Like, we've always been talking about what cards should you put in your deck? What is What cards are good with these other cards? What's a strategy that you might use, you know, during a game of Commander? And we never really built the show as a means to, like, rant about, like, the cardboard quality or things like that. And, listen, we do talk about it. But it's difficult for us to have to to have like a a video dedicated to it on our on our platform. We just haven't ha we mm -hmm. don't have rant videos really, you know. And I've I've always been a little jealous of Prof because he did set up his content where he can kind of do that and he just flips on the camera and talks to his audience about anything. And I you know I know people always say, well, you could do that, Josh. Um, but that that is not what our channel is meant to be and really what we right. want it to be exactly. So, um, yeah, that's not something I see us doing but we do have some opportunities sometime and when we get those opportunities we take them like when we're doing a year in review well one of the things we want to talk about is the controversies over the course of the year and so talking about the 30th anniversary product feels organic there but if we're just on game nights playing you know with the brothers war stuff it's just not the place for it right like right the, people don't understand the goals of the content if they think we should like you know we should rant about how bad the 30th anniversary product is and it was horrible it's bad like it's, it's a stupid product like I, I think everybody knows that and uh, you know i wish they didn't do it but game nights is supposed to be fun entertaining it's an escape it's like if you were watching you know an animated pixar movie and they stopped to complain about something that was going on in the world that, that's just not the place for it right i mean that's how you guys are really competing with disney and netflix in my point of view which is like you're really emphasizing the social fun of magic and that is something that you guys try very hard, I think, to put that lightning in a bottle and just make sure that you're trying to consistently replicate that output, right? Because it's not a social commentary show. It's not a show like this. Uh, it's not about the making of something. It's really about, like, just put the capital F fun in magic. And I can see that you guys work so freaking hard to, like, try to make that happen every episode. That's, that's like, the core ethos or the thesis of the whole production, right? Yeah, exactly. It is entertainment first. Uh, it is entertainment for gamers, so I think it has a little bit of edutainment in there, and the education is hopefully we're teaching you some things about the game or opening your eyes to some things you might want to try and pull off. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, like, yeah, I'm trying to help people escape, you know, and do what happens for me when I sit down and watch Glass Onion or something like that, right? You get to just kind of forget about your worries and the rest of the things going on in the world and, and, and enjoy, smile, laugh, you know, be on the edge of your seats. All the things people have liked about entertainment from time immemorial. Yeah. Having said that, I always feel like when you and Jimmy do a podcast, like you are able to articulate yourself super well. Like, for example, when you did the recap, I you you gave one of the... I mean, sure, you guys talked about Magic 30 and how it wasn't great, but I the, the one thing that really stood out for me in that episode was actually when you talked about how, like, let's look on the bright side of, like, there being a lot of releases in 2022, right? Because that actually means that, like, we're in this world where, like, you don't know every Magic card as a wizard, and you actually are able to explore, like, the unknown uh, aspect of Magic. So it was, like, a really nice, nuanced defense of... Every product's not for everybody. Uh, I mean, you kind of, it was, it had like different layers to it. And I, I really 
liked how you presented that. So I guess the question here is like, how did you learn to communicate like that? Because I feel like a lot of magic discourse is very much about like, say something in 15 seconds and you guys really take the time to like explore the ins and outs of a topic. And unfortunately it's sad because I know that like not everybody listened to that episode and it's like, if it, it's like, it may not touch as many people as you would like compared to maybe a, a game nights video or something, but like, uh, that aside, like, how do you learn to communicate like that in, in kind of a more nuanced fashion in, in today's world, basically? Yeah. I'm not sure where exactly it comes from. Jimmy and I have been sort of like that, I think from pretty early, uh, we just saw eye to eye on sort of where we wanted to sit, uh, uh in that regard for our content. If I'm trying to sort of deconstruct or reverse engineer where it comes from, I think one of the big things we're, we're really high on is preparation. And I think one of the things we bring to all of our content from all aspects is, you know, detail oriented preparation, really, we're not flipping on the camera and like, just playing it by ear. We have thought about this already. We know what the topics are and we've said, okay, we're going to talk about this. Let's write down some points. Let's give it some thought. Let's marinate on it so that we cover it from multiple angles and really have thought this in and out. And we're not just giving our gut reaction initial, you know, bleh, whatever we think about it off the cuff thing. And, and the conversations, like we don't have scripts, like what we're going to say, but we have little bullet points of reminders that say, well, what about this? Or that ask a question that kind of leads us towards it. You know, I think that question on our outline for that was like, is it necessarily bad that a lot of products come out? Are there any good sides to it? And the answer to that is definitely yes, right? There are upsides to it. And one of the upsides is, you know, it used to be, and people still lament this, that like less information was better because there was more surprise and there mm -hmm. was more discovery. And so one of the good sides of a lot of product is you get surprise and discovery where you'd never really got it before. Now we have to acknowledge downsides, uh, as well, but you, there's so much now that is only emphasizing, I don't like this and that's all downside and very few things in the world and in life are a hundred percent one or the other there. So acknowledging the fact that like there is upside to things that have downside is a way to sort of think around a thing. And it, it, maybe it's a little bit that Miles Davis quote, right? Like it is your thinking that is holding you back here. And one of the ways we're held back is this obsession with the negative, I think in some ways, especially in content. And I think negativity mm -hmm. in content can be a bit of a crutch. It gets views, it gets clicks, it gets people riled up, it gets engagement. Um, but there's a, there's a downside to being negative all the time. And it's that it, it tends to like, self it tends to devour itself and kind of like fester and grow and then like you you end up that's not a place where i would want to live like i don't want my me mentally to live there and so it's nice to sort of step back from the brink and say okay okay now i know the negatives but are there any positives here and a lot of times there are a little sprinkled in and you're like okay well that takes the edge off a little and now i'm not People have called us aggressively reasonable, I think. And I think that's pretty good. <laughs> I hope that's a pretty apt description. Is that a thing? And I think okay. we're just naturally like that. I am naturally a person who just doesn't have super high highs or low lows. Uh, I am a person that tends towards the the middle of the spectrum and tends to sort of try and look look around a full 360 on a thing and, and try and see the good and the bad. Well, that's it, isn't it, right? Because you don't want to let the lows devastate you to the point where you can't keep playing the game or live life. Right. And you don't want to get too high by the highs where it's just like, you never come down from that and you just don't have a sense of reality anymore. So it's like having that balance is absolutely critical. I think. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. It's obviously the way that I'm built and I acknowledge that like not everybody is the same and you know, there is a sort of, I don't know what the word is primal rush from being angry and upset. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody's had those moments in their life. And if you sort of take them out and look at them, you can understand them for what they are. But like somebody cuts you off on the freeway and you kind of daydream about like following to them to their house and like ramming your car into theirs or something, right? Like these are just things that in a flash occur in most people's heads in certain moments in their life. And there's something cathartic, I think. And maybe there's an evolutionary thing in human beings that like makes us have that in us. But like pulling out and being like, geez, that's kind of ugly. Like, I don't want to be that person exactly rather than just reveling in the rush of it um, is sort of what elevates us 
Uh, and I wish more people would maybe do that a little bit more often. Especially when you're a leader, right? Because as a CEO of the production, it's like, if you're negative, it just really cascades down to, to everybody. Like they're going to feel, or they're going to sense what you're sensing. And, uh, the bar is just so much higher. I think when you're a leader, would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. And then there's a lot of pressure, you know, I feel pressure all the way down to like not leaving the office before anybody or being there. Before are you, are you the, there. the typical, like first in the office, last to leave kind of deal? Or? I've gotten a little better at it. And some of my, some of our team, um, talk to me about it at one point of like, listen, you can just go home. Like, you know, you don't have to, <laughs> you know, it's fine. We know you're working hard, but yeah, because uh, uh, when you're leading something and especially when it's a company you built, that's like, you put, you know, so much time and effort, you know, I put my whole life into this thing for the last like eight years. Mm. Um, you know, every little thing you do, you have some thing in the back of your mind saying, you know, but what kind of behavior is this? encouraging or discouraging in everybody around me what it, what precedent does this set even if you know it's like hey listen it's just a random tuesday and you don't have anything to do for less of the rest of the day and you work 65 hours every week you could go home there's still that yeah but like you know is that the example that you want to set and the, you know i don't think that's reasonable like i mean i think it's reasonable to go home there i don't think that voice in my head is being reasonable there but you know uh I, like, I, I guess as I am reasonable about negative and positive, you know, exuding negativeness or positiveness too much in either direction, I'm probably not that reasonable when it comes to, like, setting an example and, you know, trying to, you know, correctly or optimally lead, you know, our team. Just yeah. do whatever the optimal play is or whatever. Mm -hmm. Where do you think your sense of work ethic comes from? Boy, I don't know. And my parents were very surprised when I sort of matured into adulthood and exhibited hard work ethic because I did not have that growing up. That was a thing I think they worried about me. And, you know, I'll, I'll say the one thing I know about myself and, and, you know, one of the great things I think anybody in this world can do is sort of get to know themselves and understand, like, who they are and what makes them tick. Um, and not everybody's the same, but what that allows you to do is kind of play towards your strengths and at least a way or knowledgeable of your weaknesses. And I think everybody has both. It's kind of like a deck. If you're playing a deck in um, a game of commander, like you got to know are, who's the beatdown, right? Are you the aggro? Are you the control deck? And that allows you to not play in a manner that is contrary to what your deck's plan, you know, best plan for victory is. And so I know that I'm kind of a, person that only has like two speeds like i only have stop and i only have full throttle like that's kind of how i operate i don't like to do things casually i don't find it i have a friend who's a really good friend of mine and probably the reason we're friends is he is really good at moderation if mm -hmm. we're both reading a book if i'm into the book i'll stay up until four in the morning but he will never stay up past 11 o'clock reading that same book he'll love it just as much as i do but he's just not wired to do that and neither of our um, philosophies there are right or wrong. He knows who he is, and I know who I am, and we're both happy with that. But knowing that, I think I've always sort of chased jobs and career paths that, like, I love and enjoy that. And the most important thing to me is, like, being excited to wake up every morning. And we'll have meetings here where financially – there are better decisions for the company to make, but I'll always make the one that's like, yeah, but that one's going to make us more excited to wake up in the morning. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is when you run a company, there are lots of lanes and opportunities presented to you and you're trying to pick the best ones, obviously, and go in the right directions. And, you know, I tend to fall back on, you know, that for me, because knowing me, if I choose a lane that's like financially better, but I won't like waking up in the morning, then I'm going to be in stop mode, not full throttle mode. And we won't be successful. So, yeah, I think that's where that comes from. Is at some point in my life I realized, like, you know, you're not very good at making yourself do stuff that you don't like. So you better choose to do things that you really like and just, you know, take it on faith that it'll work out in the end. You mentioned there was a pivotal point in your in your past life before you got serious about everything that you are serious about today, where you kind of decided to take 
personal responsibility and sell your EverQuest account. I think it was like mm. I think you. I think Jimmy was talking about selling his Well account. And you and you're an OG, so you talked about selling your EverQuest account and just really focusing on the things that you felt really mattered, right? And moving to LA and all that kind of stuff after college. Uh, was there a, like a wake up moment for you? Like what happened when you did that? Yeah, there was totally a wake up moment for me. So um, I went to school in Oregon and then I just moved out. I got a roommate who plays magic, by the way, went to high school with me um, and we got an apartment and I was uh, I worked at a restaurant and I was a waiter and then I was a bartender and then I was a, a manager at the restaurant. And I'm like 21 years old at this point. And I had a longtime girlfriend and I think there's a lot of parallel universes out there where I have 2.5 kids in a white picket fence and I'm like the regional manager of a restaurant chain, uh, and still living in Oregon. Um, and what happened was a friend of mine, uh, was going to the filmic writing school at USC, uh, in LA, which is like USC film school is like Harvard law, but for film school. Um, and he was like, you gotta come visit me. So I came down and you know, I had had this point in my life through high school and stuff. My dad ran the local cable channel I, I mentioned earlier. And so, you know, I had always wanted to kind of make film and stuff. But, uh, you know, after college, it was unclear what the path was. And, uh, you know, you get comfortable in life. And I had a good, decent job. And I could pay my rent and my car insurance and, you know, at the restaurant and everything. And I kind of, I don't know, it was almost like that was a kid's dream to be, like, involved in film and entertainment. And now I'm becoming an adult and, you know... I'm going to move towards the 2.5 kids in that. And listen, I don't mean to be disparaging towards anybody who made those decisions in life. And, you know, having kids, I think is great. I don't have them, but people, you know, seem to like it a lot. And I think that's totally viable and fine. But for me, I came to LA and I was around my buddy. And we, I remember we like went to dinner and a movie and at the restaurant, we were sort of waiting in line to get our table or we put our names in. And like, there was like a, guy with his screenplay talking to his agent like next to us and like we went and got sat in the restaurant and michael clark duncan was like three tables over and we went to the movie Hard not to notice him right <laughs> yeah he was just this huge dude um and we went to the movie and after the movie i just remember hearing everybody kind of dissecting it and talking like me and my friends talk about movies but like in oregon it felt like most people go to the movie and they get in their car and they go home. And it was just me and a couple of my buddies that would stand out in front of the theater and sort of dissect what we liked and didn't like about it and be film people. And here was like, everybody got out of the theater and didn't go back to their cars right away. and just stood around talking about it. Right. And we were talking with like strangers and they were like, yeah, that was weird. You know? And I was like, he's <laughs> like, yeah. And I was just like, Oh, I, I need to move here. Like, this is my place. Like this is where I should be. And I think without much further thought i flew back home and within a couple of days i think i'd given notice at my job and i was just like i don't know i'm moving to la uh we'll figure it out but i gotta be down there so and you became single is that what happened too <laughs> yeah i mean that's a sad part of the tale i think but you know yeah that was the thing where i was like I, I'm, I'm sorry but i have to move to los angeles and try to make movies so yeah you know yeah just found your calling, I guess. It was that one. It was that one. One night or one day, right? Yeah, it was a couple of days. It was a weekend, but yeah, it was just you know like struck by lightning, like you know moment. So, but that was me. That you know, full speed or stop. What did you learn working in the restaurant industry? I think or the everybody should. Industry? Yeah, I think everybody should have to wait tables for like at least one year. Like that would just improve the world by so much. Uh, for real. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It really would. I think um, you'd have a better appreciation for people in the service industry and how tough the job is. And also, it's just a good job for people to have because it is an independent job. You have to sort of figure out lists of priorities in your in your head. There's nobody that can sort of, oh, you know, like, if you were waiting on four different tables, you have to figure out, like, okay, well, I, I got to do a, a, you know, a, B, and C. Which order should I do them? Who got, you know, what's most important? What's most efficient? Like... You know, and, and your income is definitely directly tied to how well you figure out that puzzle of do I get yeah. the drink for table A or do I get the salt that they ask for at table B or is the food ready for table C and how, how do I best, like, navigate all that? And that's just, like, one little interaction through the night. And, you know, also requires you to be personable with people. It also, you know, you're dealing with a lot of people. Sometimes you have to deal with people who are having bad days or 
have different expectations or you make mistakes. Like you're going to be a human being. Everybody's going to make mistakes. How do you deal with having made the mistakes? How do you deal with the customer in those instances? Um, can you get to a point, you know, can you deal with it in a reasonable manner so that everybody gets to a point where they can still be happy at the end of it? Um, so you just run into a lot of lessons that I think are important in life. And then it makes you a good tipper also for the rest of your life, which is kind of, a, you know, I was only yes. a waiter and bartender for like two years out of my whole life. And I, my, my girlfriend's always like, Oh, you always tip so much. And I'm like, yeah, because you know, I did that. So I'm yeah. just always, you know yeah, what it's like, I'm just always going to be that guy. Yeah, exactly. Is that when you first learned to lead is when you were the manager of a, a restaurant? I don't think it was when I first learned to lead. I think I've always been a little bit of a leader and I, maybe that was the formalized experience, but you've always been a leader, right? Yeah. I know this because a lot of like my early sort of, evaluations from like even like grade school when i was a kid is like josh is bossy so <laughs> bossy pants okay bossy is you know code for leader when you're a kid because i think you haven't learned to right. temper it yet yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. so you so know. what was josh what was josh like as a kid were, were you also the note in the no chill mentality because you mentioned your parents being a little surprised the way that you ended up but what was how would you describe yourself back then um I don't know, bossy, I guess. I was loud. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I've never been like a quiet person. I've never really been shy. I've always been willing to like, like if somebody was like, hey, do you want to give a speech? Or I need you to give a speech to 200 people, you know, right now. Right. You I have probably, no stage fright, as I yeah. remember you saying. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't really know where I got that. But like, I mean, I obviously get a little m bit of nervous and a little nervous when doing it. But I definitely am not the person like, I could never do that. I'd be like, oh, cool, give me the microphone. I'll think of something. Like, it's fine. However it goes, it won't be the end of the world. I've just never been that I don't think I've ever really been that worried about like how people think of me all the time. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, this person might get a little upset or a little mad, but you, you know, these are decisions that have to be made or whatever. So I don't know that I've changed a lot in that regard. Um, yeah, but I think I was, <laughs> my parents thought I was kind of lazy because I was always trying to get out of work, you know? So I was trying to get out of doing any chores or doing anything. Um, you know, they, they were endlessly sort of frustrated with me about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, were you like, a a, a good student like were you very artistic like what were your like what what was that like for you academically and otherwise i was a good student um i was not super i was one of those kids where like school wasn't that difficult for me and i didn't have to try super hard to do fairly well at it and i didn't really push myself that hard. So, you know, I would get mostly A's and I was good at math as, you know, most good Asians are. And, you know, but I did also love like theater and choir. I played a lot of sports. I was a basketball and soccer guy. Um, and then towards the tail end of high school, I started to get more involved in choir and theater. And there's actually, mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever told this story, but it's pretty interesting now that I think about it as I'm older, where I was on the soccer team at our high school and our, our soccer team was very good. We were undefeated my senior year season and we were going through the playoffs and winning and we got to the finals. So we were a state finals soccer team. Um, and the same night of the state finals, I was also in a play and the play had been scheduled, you know, months in advance and nobody, you know, nobody really looked at how the schedules would line up or at least I didn't. And so I was in the position where I was, had to choose um am i going to go play in the state finals from with my soccer team or am i going to go be in my play and i chose the play um partially because there were 12 or 13 guys on my soccer team and if i didn't show up for the play there wasn't really an under a, an understudy so they would have been in big trouble but also because i just felt like that was probably more along the lines with what was important to me than the soccer game so uh, you know, and looking where I went in life, I think that, you know, kind of bears out. Also, like I said, I stopped growing at 5'10 and ended up, you know, <laughs> that was my athletic career, let's just say, was probably not going to pan out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or let's just say you peaked early, perhaps. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I wasn't like the star player on the soccer team or anything, by the way. I was like, you know, second guy coming off the bench, maybe. But I likely would have played in the game and would have mattered. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. But... Did you work hard as an athlete in high school? Like, were, did you try, were you the kind of person that was like 5'10", but you maxed out all of your possible abilities and like you were like the one with the most hustle and grit determination or were you something else? I was definitely like a hustle guy. Uh, I definitely was, you know, 
like a fearless type of player where I would just sort of crash into people and, and, you know, I got a lot of concussions and things like that. I wouldn't say that I worked super hard as far as like, you know, I didn't like go, I didn't like get up early in the morning and train more, you know, outside of practice or do any of the stuff that like a lot, I didn't like hire a coach outside of, you know, on the off season and like work on my dri- dribbling skills or something like that. Um, basketball a little bit more i did things like that not so much soccer but i still i don't think i was like a person that was obsessed with any of any sport and like really really going after it or anything like that later on in my 20s when you talk about how i was you know i got pretty buff for a while um was probably when i was actually the most sort of obsessed with fitness and things like that right and you studied you went to college and you studied improv was it or something i studied theater Theater. I'm so sorry. yeah. Theater. So theater is just uh, so improv is just a part of like if you study theater, you're likely to have a good amount of improv th- thrown in there. So yeah. Okay. But also, so like, it, was, it was pretty clear to you, like after choosing to be in the play, and like you, that's just what you wanted to do, or you wanted to be more closer to it somehow. So you studied that. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to study film, uh, but you know, I went to a little school and they didn't have a film program, and theater was like, yeah, that's pretty close. Felt like it at the time, and I think. What I learned was it's not actually that close, and most of the skills and stuff I learned in theater were not that usable, uh, you know, in my professional life later when I was in it, you know, try, actually working in the business, editing and things like that. Um, and then, of course, full circle, we come around to I start podcasting, and now the all the improv and the theater skills actually are, you know, really something that I'm, like, tapping into from decades before. So, yeah, yeah it's interesting how, you know, these myriad of skills that, you know, most people have different things they've tried and done throughout life, you know, can really come back and be useful again, even if you think you kind of left that part of you behind. Fill me in a little bit. Like, tell me a bit about your parents. And uh, I don't know if you have siblings, but your parents and possible siblings, just what were they like and how did they inspire you growing up? So my, I have um, two older siblings. They're half siblings from my dad's first marriage. I have an older sister and an older brother. And then I have a younger sister um, who's my full sister. Um, I don't know. I, we had a pretty normal, a normal upbringing, uh, I think it was sort of grew up in a little town in Oregon. There's like less than 5,000 people in it when I was there. Uh, so it was one of those towns where you kind of know everybody. We had good school systems. It was the kind of thing where you run into your teachers at the grocery store and they're all pretty good salt of the earth people. I mean, the only little twist I've got, or maybe two is that. I did have those older siblings who were half brother and sister. So I like to say mm-hmm. that I've, I understand dysfunction in family, but I did not have a dysfunctional family, but I got to see it because through my dad's first marriage and that divorce and stuff, there was obviously some stuff going on and it was obviously tougher on my older brother and sister who had to deal with divorce uh, and, you know, being with us only every other weekend or things like that. And so I got to see how difficult that can be dealing with like multiple families, households, you know, those kind of things. Um, but I didn't ha- have to experience it directly myself. And then the other thing I would say is like, you know, it was a little town in Oregon. There, there wasn't a lot of minorities. Um, it was especially Asians. There was basically like three other Asian families in the whole town. One lived across the street from us. They were Vietnamese. There was one, um, sort of half Japanese family and that their dad actually had grown up in Hawaii, which is where my dad grew up. So we kind of bonded with them a lot. And then there was a ch- one Chinese family and, and we all knew each other because there were not, not very many Asians. And then, then everybody in town would get the three of the dads mixed up, even though they looked nothing alike, but they were the only Asians, <laughs> the you know, it was Asian like the eighties and they were the yeah. only Asians in town. And, yeah. uh, you know, so. But I, I, you know, it's so it's a little town. It's like a farm town in Oregon uh, called Canby. It's and, Canby, right? Yeah, yeah Canby. Okay. And um, my mom had cancer when I was a kid, and I ended up growing up. You know, from the ages of like two to four, I was spent a lot of time at other families' houses because my mom would be at chemo, my dad would be at the hospital, and you know, I would be running around in the woods or the forest with these families. I'd be sleeping at their house, and just good people, my aunts and uncles, you know, people that raised me, and so. I'm getting a little emotional, I guess. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. Because both my parents have passed also. So that's kind of uh, not, m- not the best. I, my condolences. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. But anyway, so yeah, that was my, there you go. You were, got your, your, were your got parents? Your Barbara Walters Im- moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not what I intended, but, yeah, no, no, but, right. <laughs> um, but, um, 
Did your were your parents like? Did they grow up in? Your dad grew up. Was he born and raised in Hawaii, or did they? Was it immigrate? Did they immigrate over from somewhere? Or? So my mom is, you know, from Washington, and she's uh, Caucasian. She's, you know, I think we, I think like Polish, Austrian, and literally my great grandmother came over on a horse covered wagon, like from, you know. Like the Oregon oh, Trail, okay. like literally came over on the, like the Oregon Trail. Like it's yeah. crazy. There's they have pictures and everything. Uh, but my dad, obviously, the other side. My grandma's from China. Um, we're not sure where because they kind of got snuck in when she was very young on like a boat to Hawaii. My great grandma, mm-hmm. or my, sorry, my grandma was actually like at Pearl Harbor when it got bombed. Like literally there, they used to have a fruit stand. Holy smokes! Yeah, they yeah. had a they had a fruit stand and they would sell fruit to the navy navy. Uh, officers and stuff and her dad or her mom she was like nine i think or eight um would leave the stand sometimes and she would be in charge of it and she knew the rule when they were gone was you you cannot leave the stand you just have to make sure you're watching it and you can sell the fruit or whatever but you don't like go down the street and like talk to anybody or anything so her mom leaves to go do something and leaves her in charge of the stand and the bombs literally start dropping and her story is like she's scared to leave the stand because she knows that's the rule, but things are exploding. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, a lady grabbed her, literally just picked her up. And she's like, no, I got to stay at the stand. And she's like, nope. And like pulled her into like a side building, you know, and they took shelter from, from the bombs at Pearl Harbor. So pretty crazy story. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I hate to say this, but that sounds extremely cinematic. Like that, that's yeah. like, a, that's a movie right there, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's the story we'd always tell. Um, so yeah, my, my grandmother was, um, as far as we know, like hundred percent Chinese. And then my grandfather was, uh, we think about half Hawaiian and half Chinese. Mm -hmm. So I'm a mix of a lot of stuff. It gives you an interesting, um, you are American. That's what you are. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. It gives you, I think, um, you know, mixed race people haven't gotten a lot of, uh, press in this whole, you know, this this whole debate that's ongoing or whatever um but i think we do have an interesting perspective because i like to say like i don't have a tribe right um and and you don't even have other mixed race people that are your tribe because they have different mix than you've got yeah so all of us have like this weird look at sort of the world that's different than everybody else because you're chinese right i i am uh chinese yes uh born in taiwan actually okay so so um but when people, other people of similar descent look at you, you're in their tribe. But Chinese people don't look at me. They, they look at me, and I'm not part of them. But white people look at me, and I'm not part of them. And Hawaiian people, the same thing. It's not like I'm, I don't have a group. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is, is, it's not like they make you feel on the outside, but you're just not on the inside of any of those jokes or any of that, you know, yeah. that level of camaraderie. And, you know. I think that shapes you in some in some interesting ways. I obviously have great friends, and I've had great family and people that love me. And I, you know, the, I'm not complaining about any of that. But yeah, the outlook as far as um, all that stuff is, I think, interesting from from us mis- mixed yeah. race folks who are just like, well, yeah, you never really yeah. felt a part of all of that anyway. Yeah, it, it it's all about degrees. Like even though I'm like Chinese Chinese, like I always grew, growing up in Canada where I grew up, like actually very close uh, Vancouver, Canada, very close to Seattle, uh, Pacific Northwest, basically. Um, I always felt like the other as well. I mean, I'm not, this is not some sort of sob story, but I always felt like, you know, I, I am very distinctly Asian and I didn't feel like a lot of my friends were back then, like they were Caucasian and white. And I always felt like something else. And then it got really weird when I moved to China because like, when you look like this, they expect you to be from China. But I, then I started feeling more Canadian as I was living in Asia. And it's just like this whole, but you know what? I, I think, I think after growing up, like now that I'm like, what, 40 years old, I'm a lot like, I feel a lot more like fortunate about everything that happened to me. Whereas like when I was younger, I was just kind of, um, almost like frustrated with what I was, right. um, like not really being in one group, but then like, I'm not saying that I'm mixed race or like, I have, like, we all have our own different challenges mentally. Right. But, um, uh, like I sort of have a more appreciation for my parents and like them bringing me to Canada when, when they did, as opposed to like, kind of just hating that idea when I was younger, you know what I mean? Right. So. No, I totally get it. And I think yeah, that's an interesting thing. Cause when you're younger, you're more, it's more important you to fit in. And when you're older, you see the, the individual, you know, aspects of your nature as like bonuses, as good things 
you know, yeah, uh, at least a lot of them. So you appreciate them more. So yeah, I'm totally in the, for sure. a similar boat. How does your parents meet? Ha, my mom hated this story, but um, they were both teachers. I should say, I probably should have mentioned that er, uh, earlier. Having two parents that are teachers, is, mm, there are aspects of that that are not the most fun when you're a kid. Uh, they were at like a teacher conference or something. And there was like a dinner and they didn't know each other, but they happened to be sitting next to each other. And my dad, <laughs> this is my dad. Uh, at the end of the meal, he just leaned over to my mom and was like, Hey, are you going to finish that? And it was something she had on her plate. <laughs> Hashtag value. <laughs> and I was like, I was like to tell my mom, you know, well, we just pick up line ever. You knew what you were getting into from the start then. Like you could, you could not claim that like anything was a surprise to you. Like that's exactly who my dad is. I remember once uh, my family was visiting in LA and we were out in like one of my favorite restaurants which is this Thai restaurant in North Hollywood called Three Siam. And my dad got up to go to the bathroom and I'm just sitting there talking with my family and my sister, her eyes just go. And she goes, oh my God, Josh. And I'm like, what? And I turn around and my dad is like talking to some strangers at like the table behind us. And he's reached out to grab the drink from this lady and is like drinking out of her cup. <laughs> like just drinking from her straw. And I'm just like, how you know, does that happen? I was like, that's my dad. And, you know, he comes back to the table and my sister's like, dad, you can't do that. And he's like, what? She offered it. Like, I was just curious what a Thai, Thai iced tea tastes like. Like he'd never had it. And the yeah. lady is like, oh, it's fine. You know, <laughs> she hears us talking about it. She's like, it's fine. It's no big deal. And I'm like, because in a little town like Camby, that's not that weird. In Los Angeles, it is weird. But that's just my dad. Like he he would meet somebody mm -hmm. on an airplane. And he would still be sending them like a birthday card, like 20 years later, even though he had only met him once for one flight, you know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. He was just that kind of guy. So he was just very sociable and just like, just always himself basically. Yeah. He was just, he was just, he was a connector as they say. I don't know if you've read, um, any of Malcolm Gladwell's books, but I have. Yeah. 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 He, he, he was, when I saw, I don't remember, was that blink? It's when one of them, uh, he, there's like mavens and connectors and whatever. And when I read connector, I was like, that's my dad. He just meets people and, you know, connects with them. And the joke with my dad was like, if we were anywhere in the world, we were going to run into somebody that knew my dad. Like we would just be walking down the street in some town and they'd be like, Harry, my dad's name was Harry. And it would just, we would just always run into somebody that just, yeah. yeah he just was a guy that just met a lot of people. Your, your dad sounds like the kind of person that would know Charles Barkley. You probably heard the Charles Barkley story, right? Yeah. Where this, this guy, uh, this, this civilian like passed away and Barkley went to his wedding and like, cause they chatted one day at a bar and they just knew each other. Your dad sounds like that kind of person. Who yeah. Know Charles Barkley. Yeah. He kind of was. So I like to say that, you know, I'm not my dad. I don't have that exact same quality, but what I learned is how to turn that on sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kinds of qualities do you think you got from your mother's side? My mom's really thoughtful. So I think this idea of like really thinking around a subject and really like, you know, examining it from a lot of angles really comes from my mom. Um, my dad was more impulsive for sure. And so, yeah, I think I get the thoughtful. I'm way more like my mom than I was like my dad. I don't have to flip a switch to be like my mom. I just kind of am like her. But, you know, dad gave me the ability to kind of you know, turn that on, which is useful. I mean, the ability to sort of turn on a little bit of charisma, put on a smile, meet somebody, talk to them, have a connection. Like I have a nephew um, and he's fearless about talking to people. We, he wanted to go to this car show and we went and it's all this underglow, all these cool cars with all this underglow. It's like this, but I, that's not my world. Like I'm just there to bring him and we're walking around. We don't know anybody. And he's amazing. He just walks up to people, talks to them and, uh, you know, and fearless just like ask him about the car and he's like 13 years old and he just can talk to anybody and i'm like i turn to my girlfriend i'm like he's gonna be fine like in life because what a valuable skill to have right can i assume that you're more on the introverted side i'm i'm not i was a theater major i'm not and i have this yeah, ability to I like grab a microphone and get in front of people <laughs> um so i don't know right. that i call myself an introvert but I don't know that. I, I guess myself. I should just define it by like the classical definition, which is like introverted people recharge on their own and extroverted people recharge around people. So which one are you? No, I recharge on my own. Okay. So I guess I am an okay. introvert. I don't know that All I right. exhibit it in the way that I would think of an introvert, but yeah, I definitely like, if you give me the choice of like, what do I want to do? If I could do anything in the world tomorrow, it's like be by myself on the couch. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> 
That's hard to imagine because uh, you you strike me as someone who has no chill. So you're probably working on something, right? Ah, uh, ah, uh, I do. I have only stop and only full throttle. So I can definitely spend a whole day doing nothing. Oh, okay. You don't want to do something like kind of half-assed. Uh, I mean, that sounds bad. Nobody wants to really do that or admit to it. But like, it's either you're not doing something or you're like all in, right? Yeah, that's that's more what I am. Like I said, my buddy who can stop reading the book and go to sleep, he's really good at moderation, and and he can make incremental advancements towards. Well, I guess I can do that too. I'm pretty good at like long term planning and like putting in, but I'll put in a hundred percent of my thought into whatever it is for however long I need to to get to what my goal is. I'm not very good at like twenty percent. Just being like, oh, I'll do a reasonable amount of work on that today. Yeah, no, I'm mm-hmm. gonna like get it done cross it off the list, do is, or that's a hundred percent. It's going to occupy a hundred percent of my thought and everything I'm doing at, for all waking moments, you know, for the foreseeable future. And that's yeah. what the command zone has been for, you know, eight years. I want to go back to the command zone a little bit, because you have mentioned in the past that artists can steal, right? Artists can be inspired by what came before them. And maybe stealing is not, it's a bad connotation, but it doesn't have to be. It can be inspiration, uh, evolution, what are the command zone's influences? What have you stolen or that adapted from those who came before you? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot and probably a lot that I'm not even aware of. I mean, the easy direct ones are like for game nights, it's very much like Survivor and like the Kardashian show. It's reality TV, right? Like it is, you know, learning from that structure. Survivor's very close to what game nights is. If, 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 you, if you look at it, it's revolving around a game for the most part. And you cut to the conventional interviews that kind of give you the structure to tell the story and keep tabs on everybody's arcs um, so that you know the perspective of each player as you go along. Um, So that's a very direct influence for that show specifically. Um, I'm trying to think of other influences. You know, honestly, like, I hadn't listened to a ton of podcasts before we started our podcast, so I don't know if there's any direct podcast influences. I think something we've realized is I think we've kind of structured our show almost like a sports show in that, you know, the sports shows where, like, the football players will sit around afterward and, like, dissect the plays of, you know, they were in a nickel defense and they'll draw on the little telestrator and, you know, talk about, you know, really get into the – minutia and dive really deep on the players and the stats and how they like you know figured out it was this coverage and audible to this other place so that they could whatever and you know i think that was probably an influence i was pretty into sports for you know a long time i have less time to watch now but you know basketball and football was something i like i used to like to watch a lot and i played a lot of basketball I'll make basketball references on our show all the time, which I know is not great because a lot of Magic players are not necessarily athletes. But, you know, games are games. So I think there's a lot of interesting comparisons to make. Um, just having that context of, like, well, how do you compare a game to another game? And you, you wouldn't think of basketball in the same way you'd think of Magic because one's physical and one's not. But they both have a lot of sort of gamer aspects to them. So I think that's probably an influence. And then obviously, like I worked in the movie business for a long, long time, and I worked in movie trailers, uh, which is its own sort of very specific art form, I'd say. And so that gave me a lot of a lot of influence. Okay, I've got to ask. Uh, I'll jump back to Command Zone a bit, but sure. When you were making those movie trailers for Evan Almighty and others. Did you always have to watch the whole movie? Like, did you watch the whole movie and like studied it and like, or did you, do you kind of have a sense as you're like watching maybe the first half hour of the movie that like, this is how the trailer is going to be set up? Like, I'm, I'm curious what that process is like. This is a very inside baseball question, but I have to know. Yeah. And this is the number one question that it always gets asked when people find out that you work on movie trailers. Do you get to watch the whole movie? And the answer is yes. And the answer is more than yes, actually, for the most part. Uh, When you're working on the trailer for the movie, a lot of times you are working with the dailies. You're working with all the footage that was Mm. shot for that movie or multiple takes. And that's why sometimes you'll see slight variations in the final. Oh, like the footage that doesn't make it into the movie is actually in the trailer kind of deal? Yeah, or even just like a slightly different read of the line. Or a slight, because at the time you're making those decisions, it's not known what's in the movie because a lot of times the movie does not even really exist yet as far as like a fully put together thing. It's still in flux. Mm-hmm. Um, so you I mean, when I worked on The Force Awakens, the first step we had was to go to Lucasfilm offices under lock and key and read the script because they hadn't even started shooting it yet, right? Like, so they're bringing us on. They didn't know what the name of the movie was. We were involved in trying to help name it. 
And so that's how early you're working on the movie. Like they had the whole spoiler alert. If you haven't watched Force Awakens, you should probably like cover your ears right now. But if you are one of those three people on the planet, congratulations also. In the cave right now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Then you're no way you're listening to this. And because... how do you have internet? How are you actually watching this? Anyway. They didn't have and when we read the script, they didn't have the scene where Han died. That was the one thing they kept from us. Um and the mm. scene made very little sense. We walked out and the three of us were like, you know that one scene? What was like <laughs> <laughs> How did, like I got a little lost in there and they're like yeah I don't know what's going on maybe they're still working that out okay whatever but it didn't change what you're going to do for the trailer really because you obviously weren't going to reveal that later on like we we found out well before the movie came out it got revealed to us because obviously we start seeing the scenes and things but um, anyway so that's how early we start working on Force Awakens I worked on like a Fast and Furious movie and literally I was receiving I was on the list to receive the dailies with the editors of the movie so just after they shot each day they would upload it all the footage to something called a pick system. And then they would send the links out. And I was on the same list of people getting the access to the footage as the guys editing the movie. So I was just keeping up with everything every day they were shooting and looking at every little piece. And I would, you know, we'd be involved in the conversations of like, which visual effects should they finish first? Because I'd be like, well, this sequence is sweet. And I'd sort of cut it together and be like, it could look like this. And they'd be like, okay, we'll put that higher on the priority list for the VFX team or whatever. I mean, it gets to the point where we were even writing lines we wish Vin Diesel would say, and Justin Lin, who was the director, would be like, cool, and he would just put them against, like, some concrete wall at the end of the day and just shoot him saying it, you know? So it can vary because you also – I worked um, a little bit on uh, Dark Knight Rises, and Christopher Nolan is super different. He doesn't like to show anything, and so he would only give us, like, very little footage. Oh, he's very hush-hush, right? That's yeah, he didn't want to give away anything, and so we only got – certain scenes and a little bit of footage and like not as much to you know and i was used to like give us everything let us have everything and uh you know so it's it varies from yeah. from movie to movie but for the most part the trailer editors and i'm talking about the people who are cutting the two and a half minute version things that go in the theaters before the movies not the 30 second tv spots that you see um on mm. tv or whatever those are usually cut a little bit later down the line and those people don't get on board the project, you know, a year and a half before it's, you know, it's even shot or whatever. And so they maybe they, they always get to see the full movie, but they get to see it sort of not all the dailies and stuff like that. Yeah. What's the logic like behind like trying to get that trailer process started as early as possible, even before the movie's completed or finally cut? Is it is it like because the trailer is so instrumental to like the whole marketing campaign or it's like for in convincing like studio heads internally like this is what it's going to be like in terms of the vision because they only have two and a half minutes and they're they don't want to read the script like is it or is it all of the above or is it all additional things as well? I think it's a little bit of all of that. A lot of it is that the trailer really does set the tone for a lot of what's going to follow. So it's a good, you know, initial it, occasionally you see a recalibration or whatever. But a lot of times the trailer is kind of the first piece and it kind of tells you like what the graphical styling is going to look like, what the main story points are going to be, probably what the main copy for the movie is going to be. And again, these days they release four or five trailers for a movie. So they have an ability to pivot and move off of it or change things, but they don't want to. They'd rather, you know, stay on that one course if it, if it works. Um, and then, yeah, there's some amount of like internally it can matter for the amount of marketing budget that's pushed towards a movie or how excited the studio gets towards it or things like that. Um, because you're going to put out the trailer and then you're, they're going to gather a bunch of data about like the hype that it creates. And it can definitely affect the movie if a trailer comes out and over or underperforms what the expectations were. It can definitely change what the, you know, what the P yeah. what the P&A budgets are and stuff like that. Does that frustrate the directors? It's like, because they're trying to create their vision for what the movie is as a two and a half hour or two hour thing. And then somehow this two minute thing is going to influence the fate of the whole production. Like, is it, does it, is it frustrating from, from their perspective? It frustrates everybody. Everybody's got their <laughs> own. Yeah. And the whole, Maybe not you, right? You're creating it. So. No, it's frustrating for the editor. I mean, I eventually got out of the business because it, there's, as the editor, you're just like tugged in like every direction, and like the, the oh yeah, the more everybody wants a piece of you. Well, the more successful you got at it, the more you were dealing with directly with the big personalities involved that have a lot of the leverage and the power. So you can imagine you're working on, you know, something like Star Wars, and you've got J.J. Abrams has his ideas of how he wants to go, and then there's the studio that has their, then there's Lucasfilm and Kathy Kennedy, 
And then there's the people in the movie, depending. Star Wars didn't have that as much. But every once in a while, you're working on a movie. And it's like Angelina Jolie's in it. Her team's going to weigh in. And now you got another, you know, and I get it. Like, everybody wants, uh, uh, everybody has their competing interests of what they want to get out of the thing. And so trying to juggle all that can be really frustrating and hard. And, you know, different directors respond to the marketing and everything in different ways. They're combative. Some want to work with you. You know, some don't care. Like, you know, some don't care at all, and they keep their hands out of it all the way. Some really want to be involved in it and will fight the studio to try and, like, get what they want. But ultimately, the marketing is often very separate from the filmmakers. And a lot, most of the time, the filmmakers are not really great at marketing their movies because they are too entrenched in all the minutia of what it is, and they don't understand the, the broad strokes that we have to use in order to market the movie effectively. They want to, like, put li- lines and storylines in the you're like, it's a two and a half minute thing. Like you can't get that complicated with it. I understand that you think that the movie is really about this one thing, but to most audiences, like they're fighting with lightsabers. Like that's what they want to see, you know? And that th- whether they like the movie or not, when they walk out is your job, but right. the job of getting them to buy the ticket and sit down in the first place is a totally different thing for the most part. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I have one cool story. I'm not sure if I told uh, before, but I worked on the trailer for Scott Pilgrim versus the world which was, um, that's the one I think that people are familiar Your with. Your greatest work, if I may say. Yeah, so. and I think that's the one that most people sort of, they remember that trailer of all the ones that I did. And it was fun because I got to work directly with Edgar Wright um, on that movie, who's like a brilliant guy. And, you know, I actually got to have some conversations with him and work on it with him. And the story I heard that was passed down to me was that he went to, at some point he went to Cannes, uh, the film festival, and he flew back. And he told, I think, the executive at the uh, at the studio who was the marketing executive who was in charge of the project. He's like, because we were still in the middle of the the trailer, we got it pretty close, but he still had some things that he wanted to tweak. And I was still like, you do not understand the amount of detail we will go into on a trailer. It's two and a half minutes long. You will work on it for six months. Every single one twenty fourth of a second will be like thought about. And so he comes back and he's like, trailer's good, and they're like. He's like, let's lock it. I like it. We're going with that one. We don't need to make any changes. And they're like, well, you know, I thought there was still some stuff you want to do. And he's like, I showed it to my friend on the air, on the airplane, and he thought it was like the best trailer he's ever seen. Uh, so I don't want to change anything. And he's like, my friend was Quentin Tarantino, so that's why it's locked. And then they were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, okay. And then they told me that story. Friend. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. Then they told me that story, and I was like, sweet, you know. So anyway, there you go. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So. um how does that inspire you in terms of what you're doing now with Game Nights and Command Zone? Like, do you have an internal idea as to how the the trailer of the thing, like, like, do you see that in your mind? Is that like, is that is that something that plays into the process at all? Just I don't kind of beginning with that in mind, or I don't think so. We do do some promos from time to time, and I generally work with an editor here to have them do. If we do a promotional thing, we've released some on Twitter and some other places, like when Post Malone's on or something like that. Uh, cut little 30 to 45 second, maybe one minute long um, promotional pieces. Uh, but I don't think about that when making the show. And I don't think, you know, it'd be super helpful to think of it that way. It might be helpful. Every once in a while, we'll, we'll be like, oh, let's grab this one shot or have them say this one thing just because we know we'll want that. But in general, I don't think it's probably correct to let the marketing of a thing really drive too much of the creative on the thing. Right. That's so different from movies, right? Because movies have such a long lead time where it's like people just need to click on game nights to watch it. So it's yeah. like you don't really need a lot of hype. Maybe the thumbnail has to be good or something, but I'm yeah, not discounting not, that. But Yeah, for the most part, unless like Post Malone or something is on it, we don't tend to want to start the hype cycle too early because it gets frustrating on the Internet. In general, if you're advertising something on the Internet and you can pique someone's interest, you want them to be able to click right now and engage your consumer. Instant gratification, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you, it, it, it's worthless to be like, get them excited about something and then like, yeah, but on July 2nd is when you can finally like actually like fulfill that. Like everything mm. you just built is just gone. So, yeah, for the most part, it's what we call post-street uh, marketing where it's already hit the street. And now you're you're kind of advertising it for a little. But by that point, the video is out and it's speaking for itself. So, yeah, marketing in the YouTube space, I think, is, you know, it's difficult. We've done a played around a little with paid advertising and some promotional stuff on social media and, and things like that. And uh, it's hard to make it effective. I'll just say that. Yeah. Especially in magic. It's so, such a niche. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if I just play, we, we um, 
we're part of a podcast. Uh, we have an agency that helps us with our branding and sponsorship with the podcast. They talk to brands and stuff like Raycon and things like that for our, uh, you know, to, to help make our deals. Cause you know, I don't have time to do all that stuff. And they are always pushing us to like, they're like, we have all these other podcasts that we work with. And if you make a promo for your podcast, we'll put it on those podcasts to advertise your show. And we do it sometimes, but in general, I'm like, it's not useful to us because if you were just watching generic podcast interview show X, Magic the Gathering and Commander, it's not going to get any people. They're not going to know what those words mean or what that is. Like, they they have to know what magic is and play it and be pretty entrenched to want to watch our show. So that kind of advertising is not that helpful helpful for us. Right. It's good and a bad, right? You've already got kind of a funnel like of people who are going to come into the show. But on the other hand, it might be hard to attract someone who's never play magic although i shouldn't say that because a lot of people i've talked to on this podcast like it seems like they first knew about magic through command zone and and game nights and how they like well i and think learning I, about commander yeah i think yeah. game nights is that and we thought about it like that from the beginning and we still think about it as that sort of top of funnel you know this is what's going to get people that normally maybe haven't been involved with magic or don't even maybe know how to play or just are very you know they have minimal knowledge of it and that's like going to hopefully get some of those people and hook them into like, oh, that looks like fun. And then lower down is the podcast itself where we go deep on certain subjects. Like, because if you don't know what magic is or how to play it and you start listening to Command Zone podcast, it's like we're speaking a different language. So Game Nights, though, you might be able to watch. And that's more like what, what Game Nights is and why we've tried paid advertising and things like that a little bit for Game Nights. Because we do think if we could get you to try Game Nights and you even if you don't know what magic is, some percentage of people we've already heard from are like, I didn't even know it showed up on my feed. I watched it. And I was like, this game looks fun. And that's how I got into magic, you know? So at least that has the chance to do that. But I don't think our podcast really has that shot. Extra turns again, doesn't have a chance to do that because it's trying to be quick. It's, it's for people that already know stuff. It's not explaining things. So if you don't know what magic is or how to play it, extra turns is just unwatchable. Right. Yeah, you already know kind of the built-in audience for each one. You have to tailor for for that audience, obviously. Yeah. Um, for the game nights, uh, when you're actually producing or making game nights episodes, how do you keep that spirit of fun? Like, it's so obvious when you look at it, the the final product, that everyone's actually having fun. What do you have to do to make sure that every episode hits it out of the park like that it seems to me like it does so how do you guys what is your framework for making sure that happens i think it's just you know the crew and the cast and jimmy and i just being aware that the keeping energy high keeping everybody excited having fun laughing telling jokes is a part of what makes the guests comfortable and them able to fit in with that atmosphere and adopt it and yeah, it really just is about sort of the culture that you cultivate on set. And, you know, we've got a process we've done almost, well, we've done 60 episodes now. So it's not new to us. And it's just, yeah, we're really big on being welcoming, being good hosts, making the people coming on feel comfortable. Um, and just, you know, trying to make them feel at, as at ease as possible. And we know that, like, as the show's gotten bigger, people come in and they're nervous when they when they show up. And, and you know, that's understandable. Um so we try and put them at ease and, you know, it's all a lot about just shooting the shit with them and letting them know, like, we're just normal people and we're going to have fun and also making them feel safe. You know, I like to tell everybody, like, don't worry if there's any mistakes or whatever, we're going to clean it up. We're going to make you look great. Our whole job here is to make you look smart, good at magic, funny, and a person that everybody wants to hang out with. And we have a ton of editors and a whole team and that's their entire job. So, you know, just leave it in our hands. You'll be fine. Just relax. Take a deep breath. And, you know, right. usually somewhere into the game is when they start to feel, uh, you know, it's it takes a little while once the, but it doesn't matter. If you sit down somewhere, after 10 minutes, you're going to revert to who you are and, you know, start to feel comfortable because it's just hard to remain, like, rigid and nervous for very long. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, especially for a lot of people who are just used to being in front of the camera and know how to perform. That's always a, a plus. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good, really good point is we try and choose people that we think um, are going to be, you know, have the skills necessary to, to, you know, be shown in a good light. Like, you know, you don't want to put somebody in a position where they're not set up for success. So if you had like a major role in a movie and it required like a certain kind of actor and scene, well, you wouldn't want to cast somebody who you didn't think could nail it. This is not good for you and it's not good for them. So 
you know, it, it, it is about sort of careful consideration of who's on the show. And we definitely like spend time uh, and have learned many things over the years um, about what types of disciplines and personalities and things give us the, 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 what's the word? Give us the uh, indicators, I guess, that sort of tell us like this is person is likely to be somebody who will, will show up and be good on the show. Whereas, you know, we've definitely had some misses over the years and it's not that person, those people's fault, but it's a certain kind of performance and, you know, not everybody is, you know, good at it or has the experience necessary maybe to be good at. It. Cause I think anybody can kind of get good at performing. Um, but you know, it does, it's just like Miles Davis. You have to get from fair to good. You have to be able to play whatever you can think of and that requires practice. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot about just casting. Let me leave you with one last question, Josh. Uh, you have mentioned in the past that it is very important for the creative process to not stagnate, is to always challenge yourself. I think you were talking about yourself on a personal level, like to basically continue to evolve, to grow. Like that's kind of like, that's kind of like where you're most comfortable at is when you are not too comfortable, when you're always like pushing yourself and pushing the envelope of whatever it is you're working on creatively. How do you make sure that happens for for game nights or for a command zone? Like, what what are you? What kinds of things are you trying to do uh, at a high level to make sure that like it it's constantly evolving and and growing and and being more exciting in some way? I mean, it, it really is all about just like setting the bar, setting focus, recalibrating, ha you know, having discussions and being very specific about. You know, what is it that we want to do to push the envelope now and this time? What did what happened last time? What was good about it? What could we do better? What wasn't great about it? OK, what are our challenges? And now let's set our sights on the next one. And with that in mind, what do we want to do differently here? What are we going to focus on? Uh, you know, we just brought Rachel Weeks onto the podcast. And I think, you know, our podcast hasn't had that kind of scrutiny over the last, you know, couple of years and we've known it. And it, as so many things have been taken on by our, our, you know, by our channel and by our company, you know, we're doing live shows at events. Now the Jimmy and I just haven't had quite as much time to devote to focusing on the podcast. And we've kind of allowed it, you know, to tread water for a little bit. And so, you know, we, we're aware of it and we want to bring in some new blood and, you know, Rachel is, you know, just a great, mind in the sort of commander community and we just thought she was a really good fit so that is you know us responding to conversations we've had about what needs to happen to keep the show from stagnate from stagnating and the game nights team you know we sit down you know quite often and sort of discuss what it is that's going on with the show and what we want to do and you know like i said we're pushing the envelope a lot in the next episode with the set and some of the production design I've got a meeting set up on Monday with the entire post-production team, and we're going to talk about all of 2022. And, you know, 2022, we had a meeting at the beginning where we said we needed to focus more on the story. We'd sort of gotten caught in the weeds a little bit on cool visual effects and cool technical things we could do. And we wanted to still keep doing that, but not forget, like, the story arcs of each player and being very clear about the context and why players were making decisions and make the story connection with the audience stronger. And so that was a point of focus for 2022. And I think if you watch the episodes from 2021 and the episodes from 2022, you will see that we focused a little bit more on the story aspect of the show. And so, you know, we're going to have a conversation and say, cool, let's keep doing that. But what now, what else can we improve? And, and that's just the kind of thing. Just go down the, you know, you go down the list and you do that with everything. And then when you get to the bottom of the list, you go right back to the top of the list and start doing it again. Excellent. That's what I love about the show is that it's, it is a story. It is, it is about stories. You are the, the master storyteller and the head of the ship. So, uh, thank you, Josh, so much for taking the time to talk to me. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. I appreciate it, James. Thanks for having me on. I'm sorry. It took us so long to, to, to get together. Yeah. One thing just to, I realized something that I want to say about the innovation is that we're not stopping there either. Like there's discussions within our channel for like, you know, what is our next thing? We've got our podcast, extra turns, game nights. We started taking on game nights live, but we, we, we want to press into other content offerings and, and, you know, not just stop where we're at and try and, you know, keep doing the same thing over and over. We want those shows to continue to exist, but you know, we want to develop other pieces of content and, 
So we've, we're in pretty heavy discussions to figure out what that is. It's probably not like another magic gameplay show, right? Because you look around the landscape and you realize, like, when we start doing game nights, one of the reasons we did it, there's not a lot of that that exists. Now, you know, six years later, almost seven, there is a lot. So that's not a need that needs to be covered. But there are other things that, you know, don't exist right now that we think could. So, yeah, I hope everybody keeps their eye on, their eye on us because I think we have some cool stuff coming down the pipe. Excellent. I'm excited to see what comes out. Thank you so much, Josh, and uh, have a great rest of the day. You as well. Thanks.